Chris Abraham Show. It's the Chris Abraham Show, Season 5, Episode 54. So here's a cultural rift that I feel like uh, quote-unquote white people can't really deal with is the fact that uh, like it's a cultural thing that people just play their phones on speaker or uh, publicly run their music through uh, their Bluetooth speakers in public places such as the beach and the park in courtyards and bus stops and stuff like that. And um, in kind of a traditional uh, community, all the way going back to boom boxes and, uh, and uh, anytime you had portable radios, including transistor radios, uh, playing those things out loud and not quietly and not through an earbud is considered extremely antisocial. It's considered to be hostile. And uh, in general, people will call cops based on that, right? They will call cops. And you could find it all over YouTube. Like if you play your boombox in the bus, someone's going to yell at you. And it's generally a Karen. And I personally think it's uh, aggressive and it's antisocial and it's it's uh, rude, extremely rude, like actively rude, like it feels like you're intentionally messing with my world, but I know it's not that at all. So I always make sure that I have in the head earphones, and so none of that bothers me. <clears throat> and now that I have, if you will, now that I have uh, Adobe sound canceling, it doesn't bother my podcasts at all either. But <clears throat> good morning. As I was, uh, walking down my own hallway, a uh, broad-shouldered, handsome young Latino man was playing uh, Latin music from his cell phone, just like out loud in the speaker. And so that's just brought that to my mind. Uh, doesn't bother me per se, but I do realize that it, it, uh, it really like perks up my autonomic, syndr- autonomic system, which is to say... I feel, I feel um, defensively aggressive, like based on the hostile nature of public music playing via Bluetooth or the speaker on a phone. I feel like I am, my autonomic response is that I'm going to get in a, in a fist fight soon. So it sets my, you know, autonomic system on edge, ready for a fight, um, because any kind of antisocial aggressive choice is dealing with kind of an autonomic response and zero percent of the time is the music that the people choose to play on the beach or in the park or whatever um zero percent of the time is it music that i want to listen to um unless it's npr if it's uh if they're playing wamu on the speaker that's fine so anyway i was not going to be talking about this today but that's what happens. I did. Ooh, I have my hats in my bag. Yay. Thought I forgot my hats or my hat and my glasses, but I had packed them in my bag yesterday. Uh, so I'm good. I'm good to go. No turning back. All right. So aside from that comment that I'm going to make, which is also related to a thousand articles over the last five years where, um, where people of color with spicier cultures move into, uh, I mean, I guess they either become, uh, hey, how's it going? They either become, uh, upwardly mobile and move into a traditionally kind of, uh, Protestant waspy neighborhood or a bunch of waspy neighbors gentrify that particular neighborhood. And, uh, before nice truck, it's what it's beautiful. Yeah. Looks like it wants to be in Baja, though. <laughs> Have a good day. Um, so, so yeah. So there's always these interactions in uh, in, in transitioning neighborhoods where uh, oh, recently there was a lot of articles about this happening at universities where um, you know 
in this case, it was it was either code switch or it was uh, those awesome like um, hasta la próxima um, that that uh, talk show that radio show about Latin Americans in Hawaii. I mean, in America, called Latino USA, I think. And it's really, I love that show. It's always on the off hours. I never get to hear it, but it's so awesome. And this was uh, a report put by a girl who moved into whatever, Princeton dorm or whatever. And um, she and all of her Latina friends were like having get togethers. They were laughing. They were goofing around. They were playing music. They were dancing. They were uh, filling all the other awesome Latina stereotypes. And like... They were like, the white kids were freaking the fuck out. The white kids were freaking the fuck out. And they were like, you can't behave like this in the dorms. Dorms are study areas. Dorms are not party areas. You know, you have roommates and your roommates expect to be able to study and so forth. And like, I didn't have a culture of going to the gym. I'm going to the library when I was a, a kid, either in high school or in college. I wish I had. I wish someone had sat me down and was like, don't expect your room to be uh, a monastic cell. If you need to study, go to the library. But um, there's a real cultural conflict between like, like uh, traditionally like studious nerd nerdo types who, you know, really want uh, the dorm to be a, an academic respectful place. And this belief that, you know, um, ay, 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 or whatever awful type of terrible stereotype you want to, um, you know, it's sort of a, an environment of, um, my big fat Greek wedding archetypes, you know, where there's the, uh, nerdy only child waspy New England husband whose parents are the only people at the wedding from his side because the parents really don't have that much don't really have that much um, of a relationship with their, you know, it's very much an insular mom, dad, son type of experience like mine was. Although, yeah, I'm a t I, I totally don't think about it this way, but I'm totally from a broken marriage, right? Like my parents separated when I was 13. So like, I don't even think about it that way. Like my dad didn't move to a different state and a while he didn't participate a lot. Like I saw enough of him. Uh, but yeah, divorce, child of divorce. I don't identify with being that. That's really weird. But anyway, versus the um, the Greek woman, bride, fiance, who's everybody's in everybody else's business. Everybody's getting together. Loudness is a way of showing like um, love language is loudness. Love language is, is fetching. Love language is there's a diesel truck going rum, rum, rum. Rim, 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 rim. Here's an evil truck going rum, 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 all day long. All right. So there's that thing, right? Like, so, I mean, it's, it's a commonplace thing. Like, even at my Penrose Square Park, <laughs> there's always these, like, dudes who have these electric uh, mobility vehicles. And they're, like, two or th th what, three, three or four wheels. Uh, the... Wheels on the truck go round and round. And um, they always have like, like big, uh, big, uh, what are they called? Big portable radios or, or Bluetooth speakers. Big ones like ghetto blasters, as they used to be called uh, there. And they're playing their music down the street. Or there's like the kind of guy on his bicycle. And he's got like a Bluetooth speaker blaring on his, on his bicycle hanging from a carabiner. Or there's like, this isn't only a, a people of color thing either. Like, they totally build, uh, it's a it's a Harley Davidson owner. Like, it's an aggressive, antisocial, loud pipes, like loud speakers on a Harley Davidson blasting away like, you know, classic rock loud enough uh, that it overwhelms the loud pipes on the Harley Davidson and all these things kind of go together into a really world blowing experience of, uh, of what seems capital a antisocial and antisocial behavior 
tends to result in in um, in escalation. And uh, there's never been a speaker. Well, I think there probably are speakers on on the big touring bikes, on the big BMW touring bikes. But once you realize that helmets can have uh, little Bluetooth speakers in them, and even before that, all the way back to um, Walkman days, like they've got in-ear buds that people like use to both block out um, motorcycle and wind noise, but also uh, play um, tapes and CDs at those times and radio and now Bluetooth and streaming and stuff. Like once you have access to that, it seems extremely um, aggressive and countercultural in a hostile way to be blasting. Um, and, and this is, you know, in a similar way, people perceive this kind of thing in the world of uh, me, you know, recording these podcasts in public screaming at the top of my lungs over uh, street uh, street um, construction or you know, when people take loud calls or loud conferences or whatever in like the DMV or in the cafe or in a line at a theater or whatever and talk not in quiet, hushed tones, but talk loud as fuck. And um, and so like it's not an inconsistent thing. The topic of today, while the topic of today is now about how uh, aggressive and antisocial playing your music on a Bluetooth speaker at the beach or at a park in the apartment, in the elevator. Um, it's the same kind of thing, you know, when you, uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of uh, migrants and immigrants who really miss their families. And so they've got a constant stream all the way from home. It's like a portal to, uh, to, to, to Kabul. And, um, and it's always on speaker and like they're basically having the conversations that my family could only afford to have 10 minutes once a week back in the 70s into this constant running live stream, sort of like a live Twitch uh, kind of uh, stream where, you know, they just live with their extended family who are abroad. And, I, and most people, I think, kind of put it in their ear. Most people are in love with their iPods or whatever. Um, not iPods, I ear pods or whatever they're called. But, you know, it's still a thing. Like, and I I don't think I would notice that if I didn't live in such a uh, immigrant, migrant, uh, refugee building. Um, so what, the topic is going to be the next the next episode is going to be uh, the fact that I had this conversation with my best friend, Mark, and I asked to be read in since he's super like intellectual, cultural, entrepreneurial, um, Silicon Valley tech elite. I told him to read me in on this whole climate change thing. And he said, it's all true. But then he also said that, um, that in order to make people, you know, aggressively comply, uh, you got to like spook them and lie to them and nudge them and, and, and manipulate them and scare them and put them into a place where they're convinced the only People don't care about a threat that happens a month from now or a year from now. And they certainly don't care about a threat that's five or 10 years from now, certainly not 30 years from now. And nothing's really going to happen for another 30 years. So we need to make, uh, we need to nudge people in a, a way that makes them feel like there's an existential crisis that supersedes their next paycheck, right? So they need to feel that if they don't make decisions based on elections, based on um, uh, polls, based on, uh, you know, general discussions, like if we, meaning the powers that be, if we can scare them into compliance and they don't comply themselves, then we're eventually going to have to force them into compliance, which is even harder and more expensive. And, you know, now I'm riffing here. Mark did not say any of these things. But basically, the whole nudge culture that Britain is admitted to says that we tell you what you need to hear in order to comply with our larger purpose. We manipulate you for your own good. We nudge you for your own good. We push you in the right direction using a certain level of deceit so that in the long run, 
you will have done something on behalf of not only your goodness, your health, but the health of everybody around you. We are willing to tell you bald face lies so as to motivate you to decide on your own in an opt-in way to make drastic cultural, financial, fiscal, educational, environmental, political, cultural changes that are drastic and in many ways antithetical to your enjoyment, to your normal, to the way you spend your money, to the way you feed yourself, to your daily life experience, to your relationship with your um, parents, your children, your greater family, uh, different relationship with your community, different relationship with the things you own and the things you wear and the things you eat and the things you drink. Um, and so this cultural revolution is trying the nudge technique. But unfortunately, we live in a world where there's so much viable counter messaging that people can do really simple checks and balances and then completely counter message against the uh, bald face lies that they, they can find all kinds of receipts in the wallet of the person who's trying to nudge you that doesn't that that is hypocritical or antithetical to the stories being told you know uh every leader has a house on the beach everybody can get a mortgage uh people haven't been uh, abandoning uh shorefront places like people still fly their private planes people still own their lamborghinis um nobody sold their 30,000 square foot house nobody sold their second 30,000 square foot house or their third uh 30,000 square foot house or their 10,000 square foot cabin um nobody's got rid of their helicopter nobody has divested themselves from their investments uh nobody has given up their steak dinners um very few people eat bugs anyway so when you when you when you have counter messaging there's always been counter messaging but we've called those crackpots right but now the crackpots have an extreme amount of influence and everything every time there's a nudge which is done for allegedly the good of all humanity around the world every neolib proactive war every blowing up of a of a of a gas pipeline every change of uh, uranium mining area into national park every this and every that every um aggressive move against uh traditional government uh structures um the uh everything is an attempt to try to manipulate a mob who needs to steer and run themselves because it's impossible to have a one-to-one -one, uh, physical like control methodology, even with AI or whatever. Um, at the end of the day, like it's not working. And there's what is it called? Um, uh, what is the term? Um, 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 the term for it is there's a lower return. There's like diminishing returns. The law of diminishing returns. Right? Obviously, the more people catch that what they read in the Bible and what they're told about the Bible, what they read in a, in a science paper and what you tell them is in a science paper, what they see reported from local news anchors and uh, local telegram reports and, and local TikTokers and what the news reports is, is happening. Um, eventually these get so out of whack that people start completely distrusting uh, and rejecting the uh, official narrative in which the the nudging the manipulation and the telling you little lies for your own good starts breaking down and people like do not trust you anymore and they uh start to aggressively not trust you and it becomes an antitrust kind of thing not the legal but it becomes the opposite of trust people uh, never believe anything you say and you've completely been uh, discredited and nothing you say has any effect and in fact anything you try to say uh, results in extreme blowback so who knows what happens then right so 
Anyway, tomorrow... Oh, well, then I, we talked about it. I'll talk about it more if you're interested in... But this is going to be a controversial episode that nobody is going to listen to and nobody will give a shit about. So this was episode 54, season 5 of The Chris Abraham Show. My name's Chris Abraham. Please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell and share it with your friends. I'll talk to you soon. Love you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.